Hello, this is a talk for the CMU AI seminar. And today I'm going to talk about evaluating researchers. In some sense, the right answer to how to evaluate research is clear, and we all intuitively know what it is. To evaluate research and to evaluate a researcher's work, you must read the work, you must understand it, you must understand the related work, the context in which it was done, you should reproduce it, you should build upon it, you should understand the details, how it fits into all the work in the related communities. And then you will have a comprehensive, deep understanding of the work. To evaluate a researcher's work, you need to engage with it deeply. But what if you can't? In some circumstances, there are people who need to make decisions about a researcher's work that do not have the time or the means to engage with it at the right level of depth. And there are two communities that I want to keep in mind, two populations that I want to keep in mind throughout this talk. And it is funding committees and fresh PhD students looking for an advisor. Both of these populations need to make judgments about researchers and about the ability of researchers to allocate resources to produce impactful work. A funding committee, I'm going to simplify a bit, but I think this is going to be fairly representative and I have experience on many sides of this situation. A funding committee may consist of about a dozen people. It may receive about a hundred proposals from different researchers who are applying for funding and it may have the budget to select five. Five out of a hundred are going to get funded. The funding committee consists of people who have their independent careers, who have very busy lives. They may devote a weekend in total to making this decision. And during this weekend, they are going to pick five out of 100 researchers who are going to get funded. That is not enough time to engage with the work at the level of depth that we would all like to see. Likewise, a fresh PhD student may arrive in a department with 30 or 40 or 50 faculty and may need to pick an advisor within a small number of months. This is a five-year commitment to an advisor that expresses the student's confidence that the advisor will guide them to the most impactful opportunities for research in a given field. The student may not yet have all the context and may not have the resources to examine the work of every faculty in the department at full depth, at full detail, so as to construct the kind of comprehensive, deep understanding of the work and of the researcher's ability to allocate resources to produce impactful research, to go after the most impactful opportunities. In these circumstances, in which decisions need to be made under constraints, in which the kind of deep, comprehensive understanding that we are all aiming for may not be feasible, people may resort to shortcuts. One of these shortcuts is citation-based metrics, the most prominent of which, the most widely used of which, is the H-index. Here I use my PhD advisor as an example. This is my PhD advisor's Google Scholar profile, and you can see that Miha's H-index is 89. 
And your H index is publicly available. It is shown on platforms such as Google Scholar, Semantic Scholar, A minor, Scopus, Web of Science. You don't have a choice in the matter. The H index is associated with your name and it is a very visible, very prominent, very convenient shortcut that decision makers may take into consideration when they're making resource allocation decisions. And indeed, it is widely documented that the H index is used in this way. It is used as a factor that is taken into consideration in these kinds of zero sum allocation decisions. Is researcher A going to get funded or B? In these circumstances, the decision makers do consult these metrics, whether we like it or not. I'm listing a number of papers here that describe this, and it's actually widely known in the folklore. It's happening, and it's happening because sometimes resource allocation decisions need to be made under severe resource constraints such that the kind of comprehensive understanding of the work itself may not be feasible. What can we do about this? We could try to ignore it, but ignoring this won't make it go away. Your H index will be public, and whether you like it or not, it will be taken into consideration. It will be consulted when you apply for funding and somebody else applies for the same funding and the committee will need to make a choice. In the best case, it will be ignored the committee will engage with your work deeply, will understand your work and the work of others who are applying for the same resources and will make a deeply informed decision accordingly. But that is not always what happens. Asking people to stop using citation-based metrics in this way, to stop using metrics such as the H index, to inform research allocation decisions has not worked. A number of calls like this have been made, petitions have been signed, committees have been organized that issue statements that you should really always engage with the researchers' work in depth and really, really understand it and ignore metrics. This has been said and it hasn't worked. It has not worked. These metrics continue to be consulted in research, in resource allocation decisions. This is something that is just plainly obvious to many of us on the ground who participate in these processes, that this is happening whether we like it or not. And again, it is also documented in the literature. Needless to say, we should care because this affects the progress of science. Resource allocation decisions shape the progress of science. Whether researcher A gets funded versus researcher B is actually a consequential decision. It means that researcher A's agenda will get more resources to make progress. How such decisions are made is something that all of us should care about because it shapes how the research community evolves. Furthermore, citation-based metrics are actually an improvement over how some decisions such as these used to be made in the past. If you talk to people from Don Knuth's generation, 
and they tell you about how they were hired, how they got their position in the department. A typical story goes like this. My advisor called up their friend at this other department and said that they should uh, host me for a visit. And I went there for a visit and uh, talked to them, spent a couple of days with them. After a couple of days, they said that they like the cut of my jib and they want to hire me. I am oversimplifying this, but not by much. This really is how these things went some decades ago. It was very exclusive. It was all done through networks of advisors who placed each other's students in each other's departments. Needless to say, metrics are actually a substantial improvement over this. Because what if you don't have the right advisor? What if you're not coming from the right department? What if you don't have the right connections? What if you look different? What if you talk different? At least metrics that evaluate the substance of your work in some way are better than processes that have this level of exclusivity and bias. After the good old boys club, there was a phase where metrics were used, but these were really terrible metrics. Metrics such as the number of publications, counting publications, or metrics of venues in which researchers publish the journal impact factor being one example. These are absolutely terrible metrics. Do not use them. I'm going to assume that it is utterly obvious that these are a really bad idea. In particular, a journal level metric, such as the journal impact factor, does not evaluate your work, the actual work that is published. There are crummy papers published in high impact factor journals and there is outstanding work published in low impact factor journals. Metrics that evaluate the work itself are better, much better, than metrics that evaluate venues and not the specific work. Do not count publications and do not use venue metrics. So, we have an arc of progress of sorts from the good old boys club to really bad metrics, like counting publications, to the H index, which is the default metric these days that is consulted. And this is where we are now. And the question is, what should we do at this stage? Is this it? Are we going to have the H index? Is the H index the end of this arc of progress? Have we arrived at the best situation we can ever be in, in this respect? Or should we examine this and strive for something better? I would like to take an engineering approach to this situation. The constructive attitude is that metrics are being used, whether we like it or not. The impact of our work is being quantified according to some metrics. Furthermore, these metrics have legitimate uses, whether we like it or not. The world is not perfect. Sometimes decisions are made by very busy people with very limited information under severe constraints. And in such cases, they are going to consult metrics. 
Furthermore, metrics are actually an improvement over some past practices. Metrics are certainly better than the old boys club, better than people evaluating you based on the cut of your jib and who your advisor was. And the constructive attitude is whether we can design better metrics. Given our understanding of the situation, is the H index the optimal metric? Or, given how it is used today, can we design something that can take its place and will be an improvement? That is the subject of my talk today. Let's begin with a refresher, the definition of the H index. I trust that this will be familiar to almost everybody who watches this talk. The H index is the maximal value of H such that H publications by the researcher have at least H citations each. So, if 10 of your publications have 10 or more citations each, and the others have nine or fewer citations each, then your H index is 10. That's it, super simple. And the simplicity is one of the key advantages of the H index. Whether we like it or not, metrics that provide a single number that can be used for comparison and ranking are the kinds of metrics that will be consulted and become widespread because ultimately sometimes zero-sum resource allocation decisions must be made and at the end of the day the whole multi-dimensional nature of a researcher's work will be collapsed into a linear one-dimensional ranking and comparison. It's going to be either A or B. Given a finite pool of funding, researcher A or researcher B will get the funding and ultimately that decision will be made based on metrics that allow for comparison and ranking. And a single number, such as the H index, is very convenient for comparison and ranking. Whether we like it or not, this is one of the strengths of the H index. It collapses the complexity of the situation into a single number. It doesn't require tuning strange parameters. After the H index was introduced, a cottage industry sprung up where people were proposing various variants and trying to make the H index more complex, trying to say, no, the H index does have a parameter. It is one. There's a parameter of one hiding there. Why don't we make it a two? Why don't we make it a three? None of it caught on. Anything that seems even slightly arbitrary has less of a chance of being adopted. The H index is incredibly simple, very easily interpretable. Everybody understands what it means intuitively. For better or for worse, it is also considered to be robust. The results that it yields, the comparisons that it makes, the rankings that it produces are widely considered to be a pretty good reflection of reality. I'm going to quote here from a, from a blog post by an excellent, highly accomplished researcher and research manager. I'm quoting from the blog post because it's just very clear and it says in writing what is often said 
said verbally. I can also point you to peer-reviewed literature that says more or less these things, and we do cite this peer-reviewed literature in our papers, but the blog post is just much clearer. H-index fetishism is a thing, one you can't easily opt out of because not making it public naturally raises questions. Here I must interject that even if you wanted to not make it public, you can't. It will be shown in platforms such as Scopus and others. Your H-index will be public whether you like it or not. It's easy to forget that H-index is a relatively new phenomenon given that the metric was only conceived in 2005. For all its limitations, I find it remarkably robust, read hard to gain, and well correlated to my own personal evaluations of researchers whose work I know well. It also has a lot lower variance than information you get from an academic's web profile, some of which are terrific works of propaganda art. This is, I would say, the representative opinion of the H-index among experienced researchers and decision makers. I want to tell you today that this opinion is out of date and needs to be revised. I will present two works. The first is a paper that is available on archive, has been posted a few months ago. And the second is very new work that has not been presented in public and will be published on archive within a couple of days. Both of these papers are in collaboration with David Hafner, an extraordinary research engineer in my lab. I'll begin with this work, the H-index is no longer an effective correlate of scientific reputation. It is one of those papers that betrays the message right in its title. Our opinion of the H-index as a robust indicator of research impact needs to be revised. We have conducted the largest scale study, the largest scale empirical study of the H-index and related citation-based measures of individual scientific impact. We have traced the output of thousands of highly cited researchers in four scientific fields, biology, computer science, economics, and physics. We have tracked millions of articles and hundreds of millions of citations on two data platforms, Scopus and Google Scholar. And we have done this independently on these two platforms to verify the robustness of the findings. Our basic methodology is to correlate rankings induced by citation-based metrics, such as the H-index, with the rankings induced by prestigious awards that indicate well-considered recognition by the scientific community. These are not awards that are made rashly. Awards such as Nobel Prizes, Breakthrough Prizes, membership in the National Academies, Turing Award, and so forth. We have associated researchers in our database with these awards, and we have data at yearly temporal granularity, publication, citation, and award data at yearly temporal granularity. This is a new characteristic of our study. Our study is the largest scale of its kind, and in contrast to prior studies of this sort, it has this temporal aspect 
that allows us to quantify the effectiveness of the H index and other citation-based metrics at correlating with academic reputation or predicting scientific reputation in the future as evidenced by awards. So our basic methodology is to compute correlations between rankings induced by citation-based metrics and rankings induced by awards at different points in time. If these two rankings are correlated at the same time, then we can measure the effectiveness of a citation-based metric as a correlate of scientific reputation at that time, as evidenced by awards. And if we offset the two rankings in time, so we compute a ranking by a citation-based metric in a certain year, and a ranking by awards five years into the future, then we can estimate the predictive power. The predictive power of a citation-based metric to predict future scientific reputation as evidenced by awards. What you will see here is that the effectiveness of, cit of citation-based metrics, and notably the H index, has plummeted in the last 15 years. And these are the 15 years since the H index was introduced. On the vertical axis, you see Kendall's tau, a correlation coefficient. The different curves here are a different citation-based metrics. I'm not going to go over these for the purpose of this talk focus on the H index. The H index is the blue curve here. And you see that it holds steady. It is steady at a reasonable level, actually. The H index, rankings by the H index, were a pretty reasonable correlate of scientific reputation as evidenced by awards until shortly after the H index was made public and widely adopted. A small number of years after the broad adoption of the H index, its effectiveness as a correlate of scientific reputation falls off a cliff to the point that now it is at zero. Rankings by the H index are completely uncorrelated with scientific reputation as evidenced by prestigious awards. And this is a shift that has happened in the last 15 years. We're looking here at physics in which this phenomenon is particularly extreme. We have done this in other fields and we're seeing the same trends but in physics, it is the most extreme. The numbers are the most dramatic in physics. And what happened to a really extreme degree in physics is the phenomenon of hyper-authorship. This dotted curve is the average number of authors per paper for highly cited authors in our data set each year. And the average number of authors per paper, the scale here is on the right, it's pretty shocking. The average number of authors stays perhaps under 100, perhaps under 200, which already seems rather high. And then it just shoots up to be around 1,000. This is hard to believe. We looked at the raw data, we triple checked this. This is real. These really are the numbers. What is happening is that a large number of researchers form consortia where all members of the consortium, co-authors, co-author, all publications produced by this consortium. 
These consortia produce huge numbers of publications, some of which are very highly cited, such that a member of such a consortium can rack up an H index well above 100, which used to be considered extraordinary. An H index of well above 100, maybe above 200, in a few years by simply being in one or more such consortium. This is very public. You can see the charters of these consortia, such as the Atlas Consortium, publicly. This is the public established practice that all members of all labs that sign up for the consortium co-author all the papers produced by the consortium. This is very prevalent in physics, to some extent also prevalent in biology and some other fields. And it is an extreme manifestation of a broader shift in publication patterns that we see in the data. Let me show you some of the effects. Here we can see the ranking of three well-known physicists, Einstein, Hawking, and Schwartz, over time where they rank among highly cited physicists in the ranking induced by the H index. So in 1972, John Schwartz was the 11th most highly ranked physicist by the H index in, in this data set, in this particular data uh, platform. Higher here is better. Higher means more highly ranked. And in particular for Hawking and Schwartz, what you see is that their H index and the, is that the ranking by their H index among physicists, highly cited physicists, holds steady. They're well in the top 20, in the top 50, until the year the H index is introduced. And then shortly after that, the rankings start to plummet to the point that within the last decade, the ranking slipped so much that they are no longer in the top 500 physicists by their H index. And what happened is not that their H index has declined. That actually structurally cannot happen. The H index can only go up in time. It's that hundreds and hundreds of new authors quickly racked up gigantic H indices. And we can see this in this visualization. What you're going to see on the horizontal axis is the ranking of a physicist by the H index. It's in log scale. So this is rank 10, and here you have rank 100. We're going to play this from 1970 onwards to the present time. On the vertical axis, you're going to see the average number of authors per paper for a particular researcher. So if a researcher's body of work has, on average, five authors on their paper, papers, this vertical axis is going to, have to be at five. If, on average, they're part of a consortium such that the average number of authors for their papers is 1,000, they're going to be up here at 1,000. And remarkably, if you haven't seen this before, quite breathtakingly, we're going to see people at 2,000 and around 3,000. Let's see this play out. Now we're advancing time. What you see is people coming in from the right and taking over the ranking. This is the present time. And what you see are people with the average number of authors on their papers being well above 1,000, dominating the ranking and being ranked in the top 10 
of all of physics by their H index and completely dominating the top of the ranking. You might say, well, it's just all hyper authors. We can identify them and we can prune them up if we're interested in identifying the Einsteins and, and the Hawkings and uh, not having this ranking corrupted by professional hyper authors, we can just prune, prune them out. We have done these experiments and the hyper authors are simply an extreme manifestation of a broader phenomenon. Pruning the hyper authors doesn't help. The H index de declines in effectiveness even if we prune the hyper authors. Rankings induced by the H index are considerably less effective at this time than they were 20 years ago, even if we take the hyper authors out of the data set. There is a solution that we describe in our first paper, the paper I am telling you about now. And it's fractional allocation. It's really simple. Citations for a paper are distributed evenly among co-authors. So, if a paper gets a thousand citations and it has a thousand authors, each author gets one brownie point for their H index computation. I will show you the equation in a moment, but I will play what happens if we do the ranking with this fractional allocation, with H frac as the measure, as we call it. Again, starting from 1970, you see our friends here. The hyper authors appear but they are very low in the ranking and they do not, by and large, they do not displace physicists such as Hawking or Schwartz, who continue to be ranked highly to this day despite hyper authorship and the broader shift in publication patterns. This is the formal definition of H frac. It's basically the same as the H index in, instead of taking the total number of citations for a paper in this calculation, we simply take the number of citations divided by the number of authors. Otherwise, the procedure is the same. The definition is the same. This is the H frac. And in this work, we show that the H frac is considerably more robust and considerably more effective as a correlate and predictor of scientific reputation as evidenced by awards. We have a large number of experiments that show this. We compare the H frac to a large number of alternative measures, alternative ways of performing fractional allocation. We trace the effectiveness of fractional analogs of other scientometric measures. The bottom line is that first of all, the effectiveness of the H index and non-fractional measures declines across all fields in all conditions, even if we take the hyper authors out of the data set. But fractional allocation measures such as H frac remain effective as correlates and predictors of scientific reputation. And H frac in particular is the most effective measure across all fields, across all conditions. The H frac turns out to be the most effective correlate and predictor of scientific reputation as evidenced by awards. 
here are a large number of controlled experiments in which we vary how we measure correlation, we vary how we take awards into account, which awards we take into account, how the ranking is done, whether we have hyper authors or whether we prune them out, which periods of time we looked at, whether we look at the most highly cited researchers or the next tier. The findings hold. They're incredibly robust and they hold in all conditions. The H index and related quote unquote classic citation based measures decline in effectiveness as correlates and predictors of scientific reputation. The H frank is by far the most effective measure. Fractional allocation measures generally outperform classic measures, and the H index in particular is the most reliable bibliometric indicator. One concern that I had is that the H index, is that the H frac, fractional allocation, it seems to penalize collaboration. If a paper is authored by 10 people, each gets one tenth of the citations. This seems pretty harsh. This is not what I would have chosen. This arose from the data. This arose empirically. It's not the measure as I would have designed it because to me it seems seems pretty harsh. The good news are that HFRAC seems to be quite compatible with collaboration. And we see prolific collaborators that collaborate very widely at the very top of HFRAC rankings. In physics, for example, researchers such as Albert Laszlo Barabasi in particular, are in the top 10. Albert Laszlo Barabasi is number four, and his average number of authors per paper for his body of work is 5.6, which is quite a healthy degree of uh, collaboration. Stephen Louis with 4.9 authors per paper is at number eight in physics in the HFRAC ranking. Manuel Cardona, 4.3 authors per paper on average, number nine in all of physics. So one can be very, very prominent and do very, very well according to HFRAC with a healthy degree of collaboration. The takeaway from this work is that the reputation of the H index as a robust, reliable indicator of academic, scientific impact and reputation is out of date it has become out of date in the last 15 years since the H index was introduced. When it was introduced 15 years ago, it was actually pretty good. The reputation of the H index as a reliable indicator, which dates back to its introduction 15 years ago, was correct at the time. But it no longer is due to a shift in publication and citation patterns. Hyperauthorship is an extreme manifestation of this shift, but the shift is broader and occurs across fields. And as a simple remedy, HFRAC, fractional allocation, is better. If you're going to use something like the H index, you should use HFRAC. That is basically the takeaway from this work. Now, are we done? Is this it? And the answer is no, we're not done. Because when we set out to study these metrics, 
we didn't just want to uh, patch up the H index a little bit. We wanted to reconsider citation-based metrics at a somewhat deeper level and address broader issues, more significant drawbacks of the H index that are not addressed by HFRAC. So HFRAC is better than the H index, but it shares some fundamental drawbacks with the H index. And these drawbacks and a new measure that addresses them are the subject of our new paper that will be released this week. The first issue that is on our minds is that the H index is an answer to the wrong question. The H index answers questions like who was the greater physicist? Was it Dirac or was it Bohr? And the answer should be, who cares? This is not a particularly relevant question. This is largely academic navel gazing. It is the kind of conversation that scientists may engage in at the bar late at night after the technical sessions of the conference are over. But it is not a particularly important question. And it is not the kind of important question that the H index is called upon to inform. The important question usually is not whose lifetime cumulative contribution throughout their career was greater. The important question is a question of resource allocation that needs to be done at the present moment based on which researcher can make the most effective use of the resources. Now, not 30 years ago, not 50 years ago, but now. The kinds of questions that are asked by funding committees and by fresh PhD students are who will convert our funding into the most effective research, into the most impactful research over the next five years? If we give somebody a million dollars, who will make the best use? of this million dollars now, not 50 years ago, but now, from the perspective of a fresh PhD student choosing an advisor, they want to know who will guide their dissertation into the most promising avenues for impactful research over the next five years. These are pragmatic questions over researchers' ability to allocate resources and to convert resources into high-impact research. The level of attunement of the researcher with opportunities for high-impact contribution. The second issue concerns side effects that occur when a measure becomes widely known. This is sometimes called Campbell's Law. And it is roughly that when you introduce a performance measure into a social system, the presence of the measure affects the behavior of the system. People change their behavior in response to performance measures. This doesn't have to be malicious. This doesn't have to be calculating. This can be fairly subtle. 
mostly subconscious, mostly not talked about. And even if people don't overtly believe in the measure, its simple presence can bias people's behavior. I'm citing here a couple of interesting papers that discuss this in some detail. There is extensive literature on this. The citations are more fully in our paper. But this is something that should be intuitively actually pretty obvious. When a performance measure is introduced, people, in a subtle way, adjust their behavior in response to this measure. And the question is, what happens if people treat something like the H index not just as some external measure that exists, but also as an incentive, as an incentive that they adapt their behavior to optimize. And again, it need not be calculating, it need not be malicious, it need not be particularly conscious. But what happens if the H index introduces a subtle bias, a subtle pull throughout the community to actually increase the H index, to actually optimize and improve the H index. And one very obvious consequence of the H index as an objective, the H index as an incentive, is that you would expect to see higher publication rates. You would expect people to publish a bit more a bit more than they otherwise would have. The reason is that the H index attaches no cost to publication. It costs nothing to publish more, according to the H index. You can only win. Publishing more, slicing the work more thinly, publishing more, producing more publications, can only increase the H index cannot decrease it because in the H index, publication is free. Publication has no cost. And this does not reflect the fact that publication actually does have some public cost. It is a kind of tragedy of the commons, a kind of, you could consider it to be a kind of pollution because the research community as a whole needs to validate the work. When a publication is produced, the research community as a whole needs to take this publication into account. Somebody needs to read it, verify it, check whether it should be taken into account in future work. Publication does induce cost on the research community, but this cost is not modeled in the incentive itself in the formulation of the H index. And there are widespread concerns that the broad adoption of the H index and related metrics is fueling an inflation in publication rates. It's fueling an inflation in the production of publications. I'm listing a number of papers here these papers are cited more thoroughly in our work. And there is an opposition case that I can make, that I might make towards the uh, end of the talk, that maybe the exponential growth in the number of publications is not a problem. Maybe it's just fine. But I would like to entertain the hypothesis that perhaps the inflation in publication rates is not purely benign, is not purely healthy. And maybe, just maybe, we are publishing a bit too much. 
these sentiments are shared by quite a few accomplished scientists. These statements have been made in public. Altman says we need less research, better research, and research done for the right reasons. Uh, Giman and Giman wrote uh, a widely circulated critique in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. I don't necessarily agree with everything they say. And in our paper, we try to give equal share to both sides of this argument. But there is a fairly credible position that perhaps the exponential growth in the number of publications is not an unalloyed good. And perhaps this is something that we can tackle by adjusting how research is evaluated and how the contribution, the impact of individual researchers is quantified. The objective of our work is to derive a new measure that retains the advantages of the H index because otherwise we don't believe that the new measure can succeed, that it can displace the H index. And these advantages that seem really critical to the broad adoption of the measure are that it produces a single number, that it doesn't have arbitrary looking parameters within the formula, within the definition of the measure, that it's simple and easily interpretable. With these advantages, we want to address the two issues that I described. First, we want the measure to focus on recent work so as to try to assess the researcher's ability to effectively allocate resources and turn resources into high impact work in the present, not 50 years ago, but now. And second, we want to model the cost of publication. We want publication to have some cost so as to incentivize the researcher to consider whether a publication is a useful addition to the literature, whether it is worthwhile to put this publication on the community's plate so that other people need to verify it, consider it, deal with it, is it a useful contribution to the literature? We want to associate some cost with publication so as to provide a subtle counterbalance, a subtle countervailing force to the existing incentives to pump out a large number of publications. A subtle countervailing force to get people to consider whether a publication is useful. Our measure is called CAP, and we believe it accomplishes all of these objectives. Here is the definition. Let's take a set of publications, call it S. I'm going to say what this set is in a moment. It's going to be a set of recent publications produced in a recent period of time. For a publication SI in this set, let CI be its number of citations and AI be its number of authors. CAP evaluates this predicate for each publication. The square brackets here are the Iverson brackets. What is inside of them is a binary true or false predicate that is evaluated. When it's true, the value is one. When it's false, the value is zero. Here's the predicate. You take the number of citations minus the number of authors minus the total number of publications in the set. 
is this above zero or not. This predicate is evaluated for each publication in the set, and these are summed. You get the number of publications for which this predicate is true. To get deeper intuition about this, ignore the author term for a moment. Without the author term, this simply balances the number of citations to an individual publication against the total number of publications. The metric is self-tuning. The researcher sets their own threshold. The more they publish, the higher their cap can be because there are more publications over which this predicate is summed over. But they also raise the bar higher for each publication. They raise the bar higher for themselves. If they publish 10 papers, they can have a cap of 10 if each paper is cited more than 10 times. If they publish 100 papers, they can have a cap of 100 if each paper is cited more than 100 times. The more they publish, the higher they set the bar for themselves. Thus, publication has cost because publication increases the threshold that all publications must meet. What is the period of time? In order to focus on recent work, we take a five-year period up to two years ago. To evaluate CAP for 2020, we take all publications produced by the researcher in the five-year period up to and including 2018. The two-year period is a grace period in which publications have time to accumulate citations to offset the threshold P. Otherwise, if we didn't have the grace period, bursts of productivity would be penalized because somebody who discovered an amazing opportunity and is on a roll and is publishing a high number of very high impact work would suffer in the short term because the new work even though it may be extraordinary, would increase the threshold P without having any time to accumulate citations to show that actually this was exciting work that was appreciated. So there is a two-year grace period. The number of authors is incorporated here to neutralize the inflationary effects of hyper-authorship. It is a very mild term. Unlike in HFRAC and fractional allocation measures, we do not divide by the number of authors. So a set, so a paper that was authored by five people, in HFRAC, to get the same level of consideration, it needs to get 5x citations. In CAP, it's just plus five. Co-authoring a paper with five people raises the threshold, the citation threshold for that paper, the citation threshold that that paper must meet by five. We expect this to be a very mild term that should not affect people's behavior with regards to collaboration in any significant way. It will play a significant role when this number of authors is in the hundreds or thousands. When we deal with these consortia that collectively produce thousands of publications co-authored by thousands of people. Given this phenomenon, the author term is necessary here to produce meaningful rankings that are not flooded by members of these consortia. And let me show you what rankings are produced. I'm going to focus on computer science. Here is the top of the computer science ranking for 
2020 with respect to CAP. This is based on data from Google Scholar. We also have the ranking based on data from Scopus, the other data platform that we work with. The data from Scopus is a bit quirky for computer science because it turns out that Scopus indexes computer vision conferences much more thoroughly than machine learning conferences, for example. For this reason, the top 10 in computer science, according to Scopus data, are all computer vision researchers. That is spurious. That is an artifact of uh, biases in the Scopus data set. For this reason, we're going to focus mostly on Google Scholar data here in taking a look at the data. You see a lot of young people, as I will show you uh, in more detail in a moment. You also see a significant presence of AI research, even though this is a ranking for all of computer science. And I will remark on this as well. Before we go into this, let's look a bit at some people who are in the top 10 in both the Google Scholar and the Scopus rankings. The two data platforms are biased and noisy, but they're biased and noisy in different ways. Google Scholar has noisy publication lists that generally have too many publications associated with a researcher, including some that are not real publications and some that the researcher hasn't actually authored. Google Scholar profiles are noisy and overrepresent people's publication lists. Scopus profile, on the other hand, tend to be subsets of the real underlying publication list because Scopus is uneven in its coverage of publication venues. And there are some venues that they do not index in a timely manner. Having said all this, when somebody is in the top 10 in the rankings of both platforms, this gives you additional indication that it seems that they have an extraordinary combination of taste and productivity. And that is what CAP measures, a combination of taste, precision in producing high impact research, and productivity, doing this repeatedly again and again and again. A combination of taste, precision, and repeatability, producing high impact work as measured by citations again and again and again and again, very reliably, such that a very large fraction of the researcher's work is indeed high impact as measured by citations. Here are people who are in the top 20 in the computer science rankings, according to data from both Google Scholar and independently from Scopus. And this I find quite encouraging because most of the top 20 is top 20 in both. Even though the data in these two data platforms is noisy in different ways, most of the top 20 are top 20 independently in both. And I believe the number is 14, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 13 of the 20 are top 20 in both. 
Let's look at young people. Let's look at people who have been publishing for less than 10 years. Career length up to 10 here means that the first publication occurred in the last 10 years. We see people in the top 100 in computer science who are extraordinarily young. They've been publishing for less than 10 years. Four people who have been publishing for less than 10 years are in the top 100 in computer science. By the way, the gender balance here is 50-50, 50%. And I think that's an excellent reflection of this new generation, this new generation of high impact researchers. So Karen and Alexei are male and uh, Chelsea and Jinping are female. Let's look at career length up to 15. This is still very young. People who have been publishing for less than 15 years. Now we see something extraordinary. The first two, the two most highly ranked researchers in computer science have been publishing for less than 15 years. That's not something you're going to see in H index rankings. And in fact, half of the top 10, half of the top 10 are young people who have been publishing for less than 15 years. So an excellent way to highlight young researchers who are producing extraordinarily high impact work and are also doing it very precisely and very repeatedly. Career length less than 20. Here are people who have been publishing for less than 20 years and now it's clear that the majority, the majority of the top highly ranked researchers in computer science are all young. Less than 20 years is young. And now a significant majority of the top of the ranking are young people. Let's compare this with the classic H index. Here is H index as it is usually evaluated in computer science. Now we see very familiar names of Famous people, much older people with older career length. Let's see who has been publishing for less than 10 years. Zero, nobody. Nobody in the top 100 in computer science, according to the H index. How about less than 15 years? Who is in the top? 100 in computer science, according to the age index, who has been publishing for less than 15 years. Young people? Anywhere? Anybody? Nope. Zero. Nobody. Less than 20 years? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six out of 100. Very different from what we see with the cap. Now, is this because of the definition of the cap or because cap focuses on recent work and is evaluated on publications produced in this five year period? Let's examine this by evaluating the H index, computing the H index over the exact same set of publications produced during the exact same five year period. So exact same set of publications and exact same set of citations as the cap. This is the ranking. Let's see how many people we have with career length up to 10. In the ranking according to the H index, evaluate on exactly the same set of recent publications as the cap. Zero. Zero versus four for the cap. How about career length less than 15? Here we start seeing people, but as you can see, many, many, many fewer people than we saw and not nearly as highly ranked as we saw with the cap. In comparison, so you can see here in the top 
22 people when ranked by the H index. Here's the cap. Many, many more, including at the very top. How about just to probe potential implications for historically underrepresented groups? Let's look at female researchers. In the cap ranking, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What about the H index? Let's look at the top 100 in computer science by H index. One, two, three, four, five. Five. That's pretty low. Much lower than we would like. How about the H index evaluated over the same set of publications, recent publications as the CAP? One, two, three, four, five, six. Still low, considerably lower than 10. 10 is still low, but 10 is better than five. In the very least, the data is consistent with the hypothesis that CAP can support and promote the advancement of young researchers and researchers from historically underrepresented groups. And that is actually my hypothesis. My hypothesis is that CAMP is good for young researchers, young researchers who are attuned to opportunities in science now at the present moment, not 50 years ago, but now. And researchers from groups that have historically been underrepresented because the representation in science is shifting and groups that historically have been less represented are hopefully more and more represented over time. So a measure like CAP is conducive to highlighting the contributions of these younger, more diverse researchers versus a measure like the H index that does not do this. Finally, let me remark on something that, uh, that may be quite striking, which is the top of the computer science ranking is overwhelmingly dominated by AI. Not something that we asked for, something that we were surprised by, the extent of this. It, it is actually hard to find non-AI researchers in the top 100. You see Ion Stoika, four non-AI researchers in the top 100. This is consistent in the data from Google Scholar and the data from Scopus. And as far as we can tell, this is real. This is a real reflection of the citation volumes attracted by AI research. It is a reflection of the volume of work published in AI because there is just a huge number of papers published in AI. And of course, AI papers cite other AI papers. But it also reflects the impact of AI on other fields and the citation volumes that AI literature attracts from other fields that are influenced by AI research. In fact, to provide an informative ranking outside AI, we implemented a selection within computer science for researchers outside of AI. And here you start seeing familiar names of uh, researchers in computer science who are not in AI. And basically they're on a completely different scale. Uh, the top 20 outside AI ranges from 28 to 19 versus the top 20 for all of computer science 
ranges from 57 to 39, just completely distinct, non-overlapping scales. A few thoughts to leave you with. First, we've been studying this, working with all data sources that we can find for a couple of years now. And we are not happy with the data sources that exist. We think there is a need for a set of open access data sources that yield clean researcher profiles with accurate publication lists, with accurate authorship information per paper, and accurate citation data. This is very hard. We looked through everything that's available. As far as we can tell, there is no current set of data platforms that reliably provides accurate research profiles with accurate publication lists. And we would like to see this created. And ideally, we would like to see an open access data source of this sort. Second, you should remember that citations are a limited measurement instrument. Citations are a very limited indicator of impact. Remember that true impact is multifaceted and to really understand the impact of a work, you need to be more deeply familiar with it and its implications and its role in the relevant communities. Citations are biased. They're biased by popularity. They're biased by fashions in the research community. Citation-based measures must be taken with a grain of salt. The question of whether we're publishing too much and whether it would be useful to provide a subtle countervailing force to the current seemingly frenzied production of publications. That is a complex question and the answer is not obvious. In the paper that is going to be made public within a couple of days, we have a discussion of this and we try to provide honest representation to both sides of the argument. And I can give very convincing, coherent arguments for both sides. It's genuinely not clear what the answer is. My personal hypothesis is that it can be useful to provide a subtle countervailing pressure to get people to think a little bit more about whether it's worth putting out yet another publication. To get people to think a little bit more about whether they're slicing too thinly and whether, perhaps, they should invest more into each work and to perhaps produce a smaller number of higher impact, more substantial publications. That is my personal view. I'm not the only person who holds this view, but there are opposition arguments that are also very convincing. And we try to be very honest about the opposition arguments in the paper and to present the opposition case as well. Finally, we would like to see more rigorous analyses of the scientific community and how the scientific community is shaped by incentives. Today, we talked about measures such as the H index or CAP as incentives. This is essentially a mechanism design situation where we're introducing incentives in order to elicit outcomes, in order to hopefully elicit the most effective discovery and incorporation of knowledge. We want to introduce optimal incentives for the optimal functioning 
of the scientific community. We've seen very little work in the literature that takes this perspective. There's one paper in particular that we like that takes this perspective and introduces very interesting techniques, and we cite it and discuss it in our paper. We think there is an opportunity to do more. We think there is exciting research to be done in modeling and studying the scientific community and how it functions as a dynamical system and how knowledge discovery and knowledge production can be shaped by incentives. Finally, remember that the best way to evaluate research is to engage with it at a deep level. Read it, read the related literature, think about it, understand it, reproduce it, build on it. Don't be distracted by metrics. Do the deepest, most impactful work you can and evaluate other people's work on its merits, not based on metrics. Thank you very much.